Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our final fall term event for the Institute for Black Intellectual and Cultural Life in the Department of English and Creative Writing. I am Kimberly Juanita Brown, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, fiction writer, Helen Elaine Lee. Helen. <laughs> nice. Helen Elaine Lee is a professor of comparative media studies and writing at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She is the author of The Serpent's Gift, Watermarked, and her newest novel, Pomegranate. A graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law, Helen was on the board of Penn New England for 10 years, and she served on its Freedom to Write Committee and volunteered with its prison creative writing program, which she helped to start. She wrote about the experience of leading creative writing workshops in prison in a New York Times book review essay, Visible Men. Her stories about people who are incarcerated have appeared in Prairie Schooner, Kalaloo, Hanging Loose, Best African American Fiction 2009, and Solstice Literary Magazine. Pomegranate is a story of a woman who is getting out of prison and striving to stay clean, repair her relationships with her kids, and choose life. Her journey to grapple with the past, own and tell her story, and reassemble the pieces of her life is one of healing and autonomy. <laughs> I should be sitting over there. Okay, Pomegranate was the final book in my African, African Diaspora Women Writers course this term, and it gave us so much complex beauty to work with. Here are some of the words of praise for Pomegranate. These are her blurbs. Helen Elaine Lee has brought such a deep and beautiful world of people to the page. I found myself already missing them, even as I continued to read. In their survival, we find ours and are left grateful, different, better. Jacqueline Woodson. Pomegranate feels like something new, a humane, closely observed account of a black woman, a recovering addict, a mother who's lost custody of her children, emerging from prison, working to stay clean, reconnect with her family, and come to terms with her complicated past. This moving and panoramic novel starts off as a character study and evolves into a big-hearted story of redemption. Tom Perota. Please join me in welcoming Helen Elaine Lee. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kimberly, for that for that introduction. Um, Kimberly's been so supportive of Pomegranate since its early drafts, and and I'm I'm ever grateful to her. Um, thanks also to the Institute for Black Intellectual and Cultural Life. Um, it's exciting to be a part of your inaugural year, and, and thanks to you all for being here. So. Uh, in Pomegranate, Renita Atwater's journey of healing depends on the strength to go backward and remember the past that has formed her. And um, she tells her present tense story of getting out of Oak Hills prison after a four year bid for opiate possession. And as Kimberly said, trying to stay clean, repair her relationships with her kids, own her love for Maxine, the woman on the inside who has helped to inspire her and grapple to accept and tell her full and complex story. And Renita's voice is, is intercut um, with that of a third person narrator who brings alive the history, revealing some of the pivotal moments in Renita's life at Oak Hills and during her growing up that inform her present tense journey. So I'm gonna read from three parts of the novel today and an excerpt uh, with a little skipping around from the first chapter and then a chapter from the middle of the book, and then the short preface. And I'm gonna talk a little bit um, between and around what I read to, to give you some context. Um, so here are Renita's opening words as she speaks her story. So this is uh, set in um, February 2019. 
I live my life forward and backward. Seems like my body remembers what I can't afford to forget. I'll be carrying on, trying to choose right, and then the past comes for me, rumbling from my chest into my shoulders, pushing through my neck and up into my head. I try and answer its call, own where all I've been. Remember, even when forgetting, feels like the only mercy. Four years of captivity, and here I sit on this hard plastic chair, surrounded by cinder block, about to leave Oak Hills, waiting to be thrown back to the world. And I cannot get still. My knees jackhammer, my feet tap. They've got wills of their own. My interlocking fingers steeple and flatten and steeple. I try and empty my mind, but my Oak Hills life thunders to the surface and flashes before me like those shifting pieces of colored glass in the tin kaleidoscope I had when I was six. Damn, really? On my out day, which is stressful enough. I choose a pomegranate and try to see myself holding it, broken open in my hands. Leathery skin, pointy stalk, jeweled seeds. And I can just about feel the shape and weight of it again when I hear the shout, did I say you're free to go? And I'm surprised to find myself standing up. I look the overseer in the eye while I give him a name when all I am is inmate and rein in my anger as I sit my ass back down. It's true what they say about time slowing down the shorter you get. These last few days of inch by, me hoping and praying I've got it in me to keep doing right. I wait to get back the belongings I came in with, wondering what my stuff will look like to me now. Clothes that no longer fit, cheap pleather purse full of what? Lip gloss, suspended license, empty wallet, two keys that no longer open anything. Dear God, dear power greater than me, whoever, whatever you are, let me prove I deserve to be a mother to Amara and Theo. Let me handle my business, work my program, stay on track. Keep away from temptation, avoid the people who can pull me down. In here, meetings give you the fellowship that gets you through and a place to say, to remember you're a human with a story that's got a next chapter. Even if the confessing is excruciating, I'll find a meeting and go every day if I have to. Own being powerless and powerful. Choose right. Behind the walls in this concrete desert, everything's regulated and decided for you. All the everyday stuff, the what's and the when's. Wake up and go to chow, get your meds, go outside and come back in. Take a shower, go to sleep, line up for this, sit down and wait for that. And all those things that on the outside you do and pay no attention, behind the walls they're the high points of your day. Makes me feel like that German shepherd of Jasper's. He named him king and kept him in a chain link corridor. Nobody ever played with him or loved on him. He lived to eat. Buff that floor, scrape those plates, sew labels into those t-shirts, one after another and then some more, and sew American flags for the folks who hate your kind to jab you with. Improve yourself with classes and groups. All day long you're told what and when and how, and the cost of defiance too. And you hear the echoes of ancestors whispering that though the best chance for, of survival may be submission, that could also be the death of you. And love, Affection, touch, the stuff that makes your heart keep beating, contraband. Now who, I ask, can keep alive that way? Nothing much grows in here unless you go hard against the script. To keep alive, you got to choose what you can, small though it may seem. Imagine yourself past the razor wire. Notice those trees and birds way in the distance. Look at the sky and picture it whole. You've got to see yourself free from the demon that rides you, believing something new, something clean, can happen after all. Behind the walls, nothing small. And choosing, it's something precious, and it means life just might have some mystery in store for you. I choose you, Maxine once told me, and you're against the rules. Yesterday, at the end of my little leaving party, I stood there as she left the day room before me. All my well-wishers were there, Gwen and her latest boo, Avis crocheting her endless blanket, Eldora and the family she builds and mothers in here. Even my new Sally Keisha came, though she still thinks she can do her time solo. We ate the makeshift treats and canteen snacks they all chipped in, 
and everyone said what they'd do if it was them getting out. And when it was over, I watched Maxine's proud, upright back fade away. Tender, tough Maxine, along with her free world walk and the way she breaks down the politics of just about everything 24-7, her ink and her no-nonsense way and her legal know-how, there's a world of other stuff inside. She can talk up pomegranates and make me taste them. She can conjure grass or clouds or cornfields, tell Chesapeake River banks, and make me feel the current and the muddy floor. I wanted to run after her, call out to her, touch her. I love that back, that's what I was thinking. It's moles and scars, it's tats, it's defiant pride, no matter what she's been through. Like most of us in here, the only sleep she knows is broken. Last night, I sat in my cell with the card everyone signed and the little in spite of gifts from the leaving party, so sweet and painful, and started counting down the last bit of time I owed. Now I'm gonna just jump forward a little for another piece of this opening chapter. I, I gathered up my worldly possessions, starting a pile on my bunk, laid out my second string beater sneakers, t-shirt, socks, two of the unsexiest bras you ever saw, and a week's worth of high-waisted gray cotton underwear you can't really call panties. Comb and hair grease, wounded dictionary. I unfolded the loose leaf paper Eldora pushed into my hand today, and my eyes teared up as I looked at what she'd share with me from last summer's garden plot, though she had so little to spare. Pale discs from her bell peppers and zucchini seeds, smooth and eye-shaped. I'd, always re I'd already returned everything I'd borrowed from the donated library that made up the one cubic foot of reading and writing material allowed and passed on my flip-top flip tuna and ramen noodles, traded envelopes and paper for extra socks, put aside my extra toilet paper for Keisha, along with the little bars of soap that made me itchy and ashy, tossed my shower flip-flops, and that was it, what I had to show for my Oak Hills life. I was already wearing my good sneakers, my thermals, and the windbreaker that passes for a winter coat. Looking at my list of Boston area NA meetings before adding them to the pile, I tried not to be cynical about the names. Freedom Express, Clean and Proud, The Solution, South End Miracles. I read through the affirmations I put on index cards, remembering how embarrassed I was at first by their corniness, certain that Jasper was having a good life at them, at me, a good laugh at them, at me from the afterlife. The cards and letters and artwork from Amara and Theo, the program from Daddy's funeral service, and the kites Maxine left for me over the last two and a half years. I keep that cash inside the Bible a missionary prison volunteer gave me. The little paper messages that gave me and Maxine another way of touching and added some mystery and discovery to a world of regulations and taboos. No sacred space in here except the ones we create. We made do and left them behind the day room microwave where even if they were found, they could not be tied to us. Milagros, to be added to the free lit things list we made out loud and the one I keep on my own. Maxine got me plugged into recognizing and naming the things that cost nothing and don't depend on permission the things available to everyone, present and past tense. Future, too, one hopes. The smell of new-cut grass, skipping stones, a curl of white birch bark, eyelash kisses, reading, looking, walking, even if it's only round and round the yard. Okay, and then one last little piece from this chapter. Heartsick at losing Maxine as I gained my freedom, I tried to focus on the blessing of having been with her at all. And then I named what I was grateful for, moving from macro to micro. I had someone who'd love me right, people on the outside who'd never stopped showing up, children I could still earn back, 1,159 clean days, but who's counting? A novel I'd just finished reading that was echoing through me, trees that would soon be in reach, and the photo of Amara, torn down the middle by a shakedown boot heel, had survived. I had mended it, and here it was on the pile right beside me. So in this novel, I wanted to, um, 
Examine experiences, generational, historic, contemporary, that have been wounding, especially for black women, and also to de depict forces that have been sustaining and healing. Um, as the framework for Renita's journey is the emotional and psychological toll of this society's retributive carceral and criminal legal systems, I wanted to make readers feel the dehumanization and deprivation that Renita and her fellow imprisoned women experience. I wanted to show how addiction and trauma and sexual violence paved the way to imprisonment. And I wanted to connect the trauma of incarceration to this society's history of enslavement, its convict leasing and Jim Crow systems, its racial terrorism, sharecropping and exploitation through forced and unpaid and low wage labor. And also, I wanted to show the spirit of resistance that is healing, empowering, and ongoing, and that is a fundamental aspect of the story of black survival in this country and throughout the diaspora. The forces of collective action, kinship, imagination, connectedness, nature, creative expression, love, have always inspired us to make a, to make a way out of no way. For the second excerpt, I'm going to read a chapter, one that is necessarily painful, <laughs> um, from about halfway through the novel. It's in the third person narrator's voice now, and um, it flashes back to a visit that Renita's father makes with her children to Oak Hills when she has been um, locked up for a year. So this is chapter 13. So, set in 2016. They listened for their names, visualized their people coming through the trap, bargained with their higher powers. Today, God willing, they would get a visit. If they heard their names, they answered with relief and often tears. If they didn't, there was another absence to add to all the others as they receded further and further from the free world. Renita felt blessed. Her family was coming. She focused on her little bit of forward motion, and even with what would follow, she couldn't wait to be with them, a year in and clean. Back at the jail post-arrest, her father had been two feet away and unreachable on the other side of the glass that was magnifier and mirror. She'd watched him mouthing words she couldn't hear until she pointed to the phone she was holding and the one beside him. Before he left, like everyone else, she had pressed her hand to the glass and he'd done the same. How well she knew that palm that was nearly twice the size of hers and oil stained. When she moved hers away, obeying the order to return to her cell, and his lingered on the glass, she had choked back sobs. At Oak Hills, the glass partition was gone, but she knew the passage through the trap was still a trial. If he made it there after the hour and a half drive, he'd be sitting with Amara and Theo, along with all the other expectant families waiting to be called. Marooned on the waiting room pews, worn out elders tried to keep control of the kids they had in tow. Dressed in matching outfits, boys in navy and girls in pink, hair freshly done and skin lotioned, they chased each other round and round until a frown from a guard or a warning from a grandma brought them in line. Want me to tell your mama how you're acting? Why couldn't they just sit quietly? The elders shook their heads and tried to get ready for the metal detector and the stamp, the heartbreak, and the inexplicable situation in which they found themselves, the making do and acting happy, and all the questions they were so unequipped to answer. Too much to manage and not enough help or time or money or energy or thanks. Kids who would not obey, pressing with their wise. And them, aunties, grandmas, left to deal with it. No good explanation for why mama had been taken way up there, why she was gone again. No explanation for any of it. When would they get there, and why did the bus ride take so long? Why did the bathroom smell that way and have no toilet paper? Why were there no toys to play with? Why did they search the youngest one's diaper? Why did the man in blue never speak to them? even to answer their highs. Why was mama living so far away, and why did they have to wait so long? How could they explain any of it, and how could they unravel why sometimes 
even when you came all the way up there on the bus because the car needed fixing or was taking someone else to work, and you'd done each and everything correctly, abiding by the rules for dressing and touching and talking and being, they called the Code 99 and locked the place down. And you turned around and went home without any good explanation of why they couldn't see Mama that month. Because, they answered, just because. Matter of fact, they had questions of their own. They'd like to ask why anyone thought it was a good idea to degrade and shame parents in front of their children's children, to separate them and punish them, and why their children's glistening and newly braided hair was seen only as a way to smuggle contraband. They'd like to ask who, after all, would want to keep people locked up for a living. I'd rather be on unemployment, they thought. I'd rather be on welfare for the rest of my goddamn life. Look at that one over behind the plexiglass and the counter now, thinking he's something other than a slave. They might have had no choice about doing as they'd been ordered, but they, they could decide to never, ever give the guards the satisfaction of looking them in the eye. After Lennox had surrendered his, his driver's license and produced the kids' birth certificates and proof of guardianship, he put their outer layer of layers of clothing, along with his watch, wallet, eyeglasses, and phone, in a locker and deposited a quarter in exchange for a little orange key. Wait, he said, gently pulling Amara back to remove her barrettes and then opening the locker to add them and get another coin. Jessie was still talking about the blow of having to surrender her gold chain with the praying hands pendant to a CO's custody after she'd made it into the trap. They found seats behind another, beside another family while a drug detection dog walked past, sniffing at their legs. Most of those who sat waiting knew the dog would not stop at them. There was nothing to detect. Still, they couldn't help tumbling back to the lurking ambush of the countryside and the stop and frisk terror of the city, and it never ceased to unnerve the knowledge that they could suddenly, disastrously, run afoul of the law, which had never meant to serve or protect them. At last month's visit, when five-year-old Thea had reached out to pet the dog, the guard had cut him off with a cold knife edge, no touching, he's working, and Theo had cried. He hadn't stopped mentioning the rebuke, and today he clung to Lennox's arm as man and dog walked by. All around them, restless and nervous kids goofed, argued, wove in and out of the benches, but instead of pinging around with the restless energy, with restless energy, Amara and Theo sat motionless and deflated. When Lennox smiled at the three stair-step kids beside him, the toddler hid her face in his grandma's sleeve, the middle one smiled, and pointed to her missing front teeth, and the eldest said, hi, mister, their mama locked up too. Grandma apologized, pulling him closer, and launched into what she told him on the bus about how to act. And then they were called, and she was getting to her feet, pulling her string of little ones along. Why can't they call us, Amara asked with sullen sadness. Again and again, Lennox looked at his, wa at his wrist, though the only thing to see was a pale band of freckled brown skin. He pulled the locker key from his pocket and put it back three times. The slacks and button down he wore whenever he was not at work were well within the rules, but he looked at the dress code posted on the wall in English and Spanish. For a man, no blue denim pants, no cargo pants, no double layered clothing, no sweatshirts, no hooded sweatshirts or jackets, no t-shirts, no pockets with holes. It was more challenging for women, as Jessie had found. She'd been turned away once for excessive pockets. No skirts with slits, no skirts more than three inches above the knee, no shorts, no skorts. What in God's name was a skort, he'd asked her. No tank tops, no halter tops, no scarves, no low-cut tops, no form-fitting stretch pants, no bathing suits. Another question for his sister. Who would wear a bathing suit to the penitentiary? No sheer clothing with or without a bra. At her first visit, Jessie's underwire bra had set off the metal detector, and she'd been taken to a little room for a pat-down search at the hands of a stone-faced stranger. After standing with her arms outstretched, pulling the wire away from her rib cage and her waistband from her belly, lifting the bottoms of her feet while trying to balance on, on one leg like a ridiculous flamingo stuck in the least exotic of places, she had come braless, 
in a pullover that was roomy enough to hide the evidence of her drooping middle-aged breasts, but not too baggy to prevent entry. When their turn finally came, the heavy metal door rattled open and shut behind Lennox and the kids, and they were taking off their shoes and putting them in a bin, turning out their pockets, getting the black light stamps on their wrists, and walking through the metal detector archway. Through it all, Lennox stood tall and looked past the cold, dismissive glances of the guards who puffed out their chests with self-importance and shook their heads at the failure of his family, his people. He answered the question on the clipboard he was handed. Have you ever been convicted of a crime? Writing a big, bold, uppercase no. Coming through the buzzing gates with a child by each hand, he moved toward visitation looking down at their feet and their three gleaming shadows on the buff linoleum floor. 14, 15, 16 steps and 23 to go until the next door, a right turn and then 12 more. Now sitting for the final wait, he watched the door. As soon as she entered the room, Renita heard the voices of children and saw the mothers, grandmas, aunties and sisters who sat with them and the few men who stood, up, stood out like trees on the prairie. There was Daddy sitting with her babies, who were almost too beautiful to bear. Kids chattered and jumped around, trying to hard, hard to entertain themselves with out-of-date highlights magazines and a few worn or disabled toys. A truck with three wheels, a doll with matted blonde hair and sightless blue eyes. They argued and complained, this one hit me, that one teased me, that one took my seat. A boy stood apart, arms folded and tucked into his body, silent and wary of his disappearing, reappearing mom. A toddler, dressed in the denim and timberlands of a miniature man, stiffened in his mother's insistent hug. A family played gin rummy with a deck of limp cards. The Oak Hills women ached for these visits, proof that life and love go on. And once they came, they weren't sure they could endure the stilted positivity. The walls with their fake wood paneling seemed to close in, and the cheerful posters of panda bears and smarmy memes mocked. The lit up soda and junk food machines enticed, only to overcharge and disappoint. And the overseers looked on with pity and indifference. Still, there were miracles. The hugs for bodies craving touch, the loving faces returned to them briefly, smiling in spite of the mournful mood. A mother played peekaboo over and over, glowing at how she could make her baby smile. A couple stared with hope and longing into each other's eyes as they claimed this now. Trying to refuse the blank surveillance eyes of holstered guards that ravaged every intimacy, Renita made her way to the children who sat eerily quiet and the father, who was still showing up for her, nodding and saying afternoon to those she passed as she heard Lennox's voice inside her head. We speak to each other, wherever we are, it binds us. It says we're people, whatever they think or say or do. She gave her father a quick squeeze and a kiss and then squatted down to Theo's height and tried to put her arms around both kids. Amara's arms hung limp and Theo reached for her, then pulled away. As soon as they sat down, the visit started slipping through her fingers. They'd just arrived, and her first thought was how long until they had to go. How are you doing, Nita? Lennox asked, and she answered, fine, I'm doing fine. They'd always been good at talking without going anywhere painful. How have you been keeping busy, Lennox asked. Hmm, I've been reading again. It seems to help. And crocheting. She asked about school and after school and the neighborhood kids, but every try at conversation, lighthearted or probing, fizzled. She sent them to the vending machine she wasn't allowed to use, hoping her father would say something real about how they were doing. But he just sat between the chairs they had vacated, looking morose. She knew his credo, keep on providing, keep on loving. How, do you talk, how did you talk about something like prison without making things worse? You feeling good, Mama, Amara asked, seeming older than her 10 years, when the kids were back at the table and digging into their snacks. Resisting the urge to promise that this time she'd conquer it, this time her recovery would take, she said she was working hard at being well. 
Looking over at the photographer who was setting up, Renita asked cheerfully, want to take a photo, the four of us? No one spoke or moved. She saw her father look over at the backdrop of turquoise water and palm trees, and then at the door. Renita had seen other mothers showing their photos around, and she wanted one too. Seems like uh, nodding at, a, at the family, getting a picture taken, she said, look at them. Seems like it's a good thing, doesn't it? We can both have a copy, and that way we'll be able to see us all together anytime we want. We'll be seeing the same thing, maybe even at the same time. Amara and Theo looked at each other. Lennox said, you all go on then, let it be the three of you. And when Renita stood, the kids did too, walking with her to wait their turn. Renita paid for two copies, or her father did, since it was his money on her books. And when their turn came, they arranged themselves in front of the 2D beach, her on one knee with her right arm around Theo and Amara on her left almost touching her. When she held one of the copies out to her father, he shook his head and said, I'd prefer a different reference point. She put it on the table in front of him, hoping he'd change his mind, and sat back down to look at herself with her children, frozen now in time. The air felt thick and heavy, and they tried for goodwill, but it was a carcass pick clean. They'd gotten Doritos and candy and soda from the vending machine, taken a photo, exhausted their news and their pretenses. And Renita wished she had things to share, but she was on pause from life. What could she tell them? She'd stood for count at 6 o'clock, 11.15, 4.30, and 9.30. She'd gone to chow, watched a spades game, and listened to stories about plants with tap roots, and watched women sneak affection in the day room. Buffed the floor, gone to chow twice more, cried herself with, to sleep with regret and loneliness. She was story poor. They sat silently across from each other, running out the clock. And then, leaning across the table to take their hands, Renita went somewhere she knew was a misstep as she opened her mouth. I hate to see you leave. When you're gone, I miss you so bad. She saw Amara's face hardening, but she couldn't seem to stop talking. I picture you at the house or at school or playing out back. She saw Amara balling up her fist but kept going. And it's so tough being away from you. Sometimes I feel like my heart's breaking. And that was it. Amara blew. What about us, Mama? Renita felt the faint spray of her daughter's spit on her face as she shouted, it's like we're locked up too. Her cry shook her skinny 10-year-old body and Renita looked over at the CO standing on the wall and was flooded with shame. She watched, he, he watched, but registered no compassion, no mercy, no regard at all. As Renita got up and went to her daughter and took her in her arms, <clears throat> and Theo buried his face in his grandpa's side, asking, Granddaddy, why can't Mama come home with us? When the tears subsided and Renita went back to her chair, Amara slid the photo closer and stared at it before saying, You'll get better, Mama. I know you will. Renita felt the last minutes of what she'd prayed for expire with mourning and relief. And just before the time was up, she couldn't help asking, when you think you'll come again? She watched them disappear from view, and now it was time to pay for her good fortune and prove the body's innocence. Herded into a private room, those lucky enough to have had a visit faced three COs, one a female who'd been detailed there for the protection of the women inside. You know the routine, she said, with icy detachment, making clear, in case they missed it, that the whole thing meant less than nothing to her. They did know the routine. They'd learned it after every visit, in the search for serious contraband, returning from a funeral, the hospital, a trip to court, and whenever some CO felt like it. With no choice but survival, they stripped like they had so many times, looking straight ahead and looking back to all the other takings embedded in their cells. Human cargo passages and auction block appraisals, escapes and captures, rapes and other unrecorded conquests, lynchings to entertain others and warn their kind, chain gangs and coffin cells, fire hoses and dog whistles and flaming crosses, police on the other side of the gun and on their necks, 
They handed their clothes over for inspection, burying the bodies that had kept track of their mishaps and hurtings, of the accidents and want and illness and aggression that had left their marks, along with the things that they chose to say in dark blue ballpoint ink. Their flesh said, here's where I fell off my bike, where I scraped myself climbing that fence where my adolescent batony bloomed. This is from my C-section with my firstborn, and here's the mark from fighting off that Klansman CO. Here's the cigarette burn my ex gave me to remember him when I tried to get free. Here are the traces of the tracks I used to hide, and this is my first boyfriend's name, inked half my life ago. The fat around my middle is the story of canteen chips and empty calories of salt and starch and sugar that have passed for nourishment inside the walls. And this is where I muscled up, lifting and planking to defend myself and fill the time. Here's what my body's got to say about the days and months and years spent where doctors and dentists and fresh air and sunlight have been in short supply. They spread their feet apart, lifted each one to show the soul, wiggled their toes, leaned forward and shook out their hair folded each ear forward, tilted their heads back to expose the nostrils, opened their mouths wide, lifted their tongues, rolled their top and bottom lips, raised both arms, lifted their breasts and their fat rolls, pulled their any belly buttons open, ran their fingers through their pubes and spread their pussies, squatted, coughed three times, turned around, bent over, spread their ass cheeks, coughed again three times. They tried to go elsewhere, concentrated on the doorway, bit their cheeks, but they could feel the inside wounds, the tally kept from the punishments, the things they had been named and deemed, the ways they had tried and fallen short. From the poisons in their blood and lungs that had seemed like liberation, from the ones who broke and entered using kinship and prayer as passwords, from the daily wound of being reckoned less than human, the toll of being thrown away like trash. Silently they chanted, this is my body. It is still here and it is still mine. And it is known worse than this, along with its portion of pleasure and kindness and love. It was mine, it is mine, it will be mine. But it is also just a body and I can leave it and go past hurt, past feeling, past anything you can do to me in here today. Okay, that was a lot, I know. <laughs> so, so in this chapter, um, we feel the, the pain of historical, generational, and interpersonal violence um, echoing in the, the bodies and souls of the characters. And, and we feel the struggle to be human and complex and defiant and hopeful and loving within the context of oppressive state authority. So I'm not gonna leave you there, <laughs> though. With this last short excerpt, I'm gonna give you some of the hope and possibility that are, that are threaded through Renita's journey of healing accept and self-acceptance and autonomy. So um, informing Renita's addiction are the ravages of her experience and inheritance, and yet uh, the, the generative resources around and within her can be discovered and retrieved, and that's one of the things I'm after um, with this novel. So, so here's the preface, um, which is about loss and receiving, I think, about those you know, two things that are kind of polarities uh, in our lives. So for this first two pages, this page of the preface. Mama was gone and not gone. She had disappeared into the hospital while Renita was at school, getting tamed and stuffed with facts and equations. And there she lay, immobilized by tubes and wires. Renita had stood beside her hospital bed, watching the blue ventilator bag fill and empty, trying to understand how Geneva Atwater had been felled by something as tiny as a blood clot. She had seen her dying. And after the mourners filed past Renita at the wake, grateful for the phrase that helped them navigate the sudden woe, sorry, so sorry, so sorry for your loss, she had stood beside the coffin and stared at her mother, lying in its white satin folds like a parody of a fancy gift box display. 
The shiny wig Daddy knew she would have wanted, low on her forehead like a helmet, skin waxy and mouth pressed shut, eyes closed to her for good now. She had seen her dead, but she heard her mother's voice in the back door alcove at the table in the basement, and now she would never please her, never tell her what she was keeping inside, never love her more than she feared her. A month after the funeral, she sat across from Auntie Jessie, picking at one of the casseroles the church ladies kept bringing. She brought a book to the table, which had never been allowed, but there were fewer shouts and shout nots now that Jessie had joined Daddy at the house until things eased up. He stretched out work as long as possible and escaped to go fishing on the weekends, and both he and Jessie tried to stave off the bloated gloom with food, encyclopedia facts, artificial cheer. Neither one talked about Geneva. Neither one asked Renita about her sadness. That was the family way, and what hurt kept haunting like a hungry ghost. She heard the front door open and close, and there was Daddy in the archway, smiling like a moonlighting jester, chuckling from his belly like he was launching a magic trick. He pulled a dented orb from a brown paper bag, and Renita told herself to smile. She'd seen photos and drawings of pomegranates, but not a real one. Where'd you get that, she asked, more edgy than she intended, and his smile wobbled. Your birthday, getting lost in the shuffle and whatnot, I thought, he began. She looked away. Eclipse was more like it. He put the fruit in her hands. There's no making up for what's past, but this here, it's got some surprising and wonderful news buried just inside. Expecting a whole lot of nothing, her fingers studied the scratched and ordinary skin. He said they should wait to open it. Sometimes waiting made things better. You hungry, Lennox? Auntie Jessie asked, getting him a plate and listening as he told about the engine repairs and paint restorations that had filled his day. She kept him chattering while Renita muted their voices in her head, turning the pomegranate to take in its flat and faded spots pressing on the sharp crown at the top. And when she was about to get up and wait on something else, he said, let's open it. Renita peeled back the rind and pried the bloodshot gems from the spongy membrane that held the whole thing together. She was struck silent, awed by the wild design of it and by the little bursts of sour sweet juice from the seeds that turned her fingers red. There was a whole world strange and crazy beautiful underneath the skin, layer on crooked layer of ruby crystals and chambers like inside a heart. So we're all, we're all um, left to grapple with the echoing losses of our lives, um, but, our, but our bodies and our vision and our voices can be reclaimed. And in our hearts, you know, alongside the losses are our abundance and possibility. And uh, the beauty around us and within us and between us, the gifts we've been given, um, the free things, you know, that Maxine and, and, and Renita have been naming, they all belong to us. And we might find our hands filled, perhaps through memory and imagination, with what we need. And it might be something every day or seemingly small or ordinary on the outside and wondrous within. Thank you. And now we're going to talk, I guess. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I have a question to start off, and then we'll open it up to, to others, if you're very nice. Um, but the question that I have to start off with is how you negotiate the space between trauma and evolution for Renita, mm. and how you held those things together without so much explicit harm for the reader. Does that make sense? Without explicit harm? Because oh, yes. <laughs> I, I, you know, when I, that section I just read, the, the visit, the strip search and all, it's so painful. And, 
I, wear, I, I read it recently at a reading I did at MIT, and I, I wondered if it felt like explicit harm for the reader, but <laughs> I don't know. I guess I, believe, I do mean to disturb you, you know, because um, literature has that power, I think, to expand our and deepen our understanding, to disrupt our um, and complicate our notions of life. And if so many, you know, over two million people can live that experience, then, then I figure we can, uh, I can write it and you can read and, read and listen to it. So, but, I, but I know it is, it is hard going and a lot, you know, so are some of the childhood experiences that she has. But um, so how I, I wanted to tell it true, you know, but that also, she's more than, her trauma, you know, and I get, so that one of the ways I guess of negotiating that was to show make her a person, you know, with a a complex person with a whole, um, you know, history that some of, some of which is traumatic and and painful, and 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 some of it which is which is you know a whole ra a range of experiences I guess, and um, and and to show you that you know through so I think the fact that. You see her in the, it alternates, you know, between the first person journey. And, you, and so you see her spirit, you know, and you hear, hear that in her voice. And you see her getting it together. And you see her complexity. So you know, you're moving forward in that way. And then you're taken back, back to these moments. But I mean, I always return you to the journey she's making. So I think, I think the, um, that alternation of the first and third, and there, there are some other reasons I you know, and ended up telling the story in that way too. But that I think that accomplishes that that you, you're returned always to, to her, even when she's struggling with you know, with getting out and get, and getting it together. There is the power that she has inside and the love that's been imparted to her. Um, some of it in the present tense journey, and some of it you know, uh, in the past. And I guess there are the resources that I gave her because I want her to make it, you know. So, so she has these, she loves books and stories and she has that to draw on and um, she has this great imagination which Maxine kind of re reignites, you know, and together this naming the, naming the free things or all the ways that they sort of practice um, uh, imagination in a healing way. And then she has the steady love of, uh, her father and her aunties, and some of the things her father imparted to her, like uh, intellectual curiosity. They do these encyclopedia dives, and um, and uh, a love of nature. You know, they, one of the um, flashbacks scenes, third person scenes, is the growing a garden together. And though you know that her mother has a force in that scene that's that's. That's painful, but so the he, the father's the sort of counterweight, I guess. So, um, you know, so I, she's got these things to draw on, I think, and hopefully those those are what you feel in a, a, a sense of. One of my students read it when it was in the galley form, and and she said it's a lot, a lot of it's painful, but I always felt hope. So, I guess the, you know, I'm trying to give you a, a rough story, but with all that context to make it bearable. Absolutely agreed. Um, one of the things that we've gone over in class is the, you know, unwritten theme of the course is how do you love a complex woman? Uh, the unwritten theme of what? The course, the class. Oh, okay. Is how do you love a, a complex woman? Because part of the gendered construction is to think of women as, as simple or as easy. Mm. And they're not that. And Renita is our best example of what that might look like if you follow it all the way through. Okay, I'm going to open it to questions. I wanted to ask for Renita how um, her connection with nature and how does that kind of like, how does that have an impact on her redemption as a person? Yeah. And I think you probably knows the, know the answer to that because <laughs> you talked about it in class. Uh, well, as I said, you know, I wanted that to be um, one of her resources. You know, one of one of the things she has to draw on. You know, an, an example of her her life force. And um, 
And I tr and that's you know runs through. I've tried to thread that throughout the novel, whether it's the, the growing of the garden or the identification with trees. You know, she she names the trees at home and climbs up into one of them, and she. Uh, I think Maxine says, you're part tree, you know, so she feels this deep, deep connection, and as she walks the city, you, you see her, you know, relate in that way, I guess, so, um, but, but um, I think of, I guess, that for those who have not read it, this is a bit of a spoiler, but, I, you know, when she recovers that memory of going out when she's, that after her mother does it, sort of emotionally invalidates her, she, um, She's pressed it down and kind of unremembered it, along with the, along with the traumatic thing. She's, you know, suppressed, um, and then she gets this gift, you know, near near the end of the book of the memory that she she went outside after that happened in the middle of the night and danced in the rain, you know, and and uh, to me that sort of the pivotal. Uh, it's a page long chapter, but this may be my, feels to me like one of the most pivotal moments because what it says is that she, that's in her. She hasn't lost it. Just like the, she says, you know, stop singing and she, she realizes that that's in her too, right? That she, that's another one of the resources, I guess, she, she has to draw on that. It's, you know, it's part of her and, and she can recover it. And um, so, um, you know, that's the role I wanted the, wanted that love it's a healing has a healing force it's, it's available even though you know she bemoans how there are so few trees in her neighborhood and you know that that's a that's a, a, a truth of, <laughs> of living in black urban spaces that there isn't as much green as many other people in but you claim claim what you have and you imagine what you what you don't have I suppose and and um and that moment when she I guess what I'm trying to say with that is that you know, she's more than her trauma, and she has embedded in her this powerful life force that, that you know, belongs to her. So thank you so much for reading. It's absolutely beautiful um, and difficult to listen to simply because it's actually so graphic. Yeah. Um, I, I'm it's not to... all like the whole book's not <laughs> <laughs> either to be like that either. No, but I think it's uh, yeah. critically important, especially when we're trying to process trauma and go through it. Um, because like going back into the words of Roxane Gay, it's right within the wound in order to make the trauma. But um, my question to you, you were talking about the idea of imagination and healing. Um, I wanted to know more about the critical importance of imagination and healing and how do you sort of get away from trauma with imagination, right? Yeah. And how is that a healing practice, right? Incorporated with your story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so some of the, so she, um, I'm gonna tie that to another thing that's, you know, these these resources I'm saying that, that we have, have to sustain us. So, because I, I like the way you use the word practice. So one of the things she comes to understand that, at the end of the book is that love is a practice too, you know, that it, that is about a, a love with accountability, right? That is about a, da a daily struggle to, to love yourself and other people. It's not some sort of, in the Baldwin sense, you know, it's not, it's not some sort of sentimental, sloppy, sloppy, sloppily sentimental thing, you know, it's a, as he says, it's a war, you know, but, um, but so I think along with, you know, the, the, the um, naming the, the free things, you know, the relating to the nature and the trees. It ta she takes these walks, you know, all of that. Those are pra our practices too. And so, uh, some of the ways that the imagination plays out as a practice is partly through reading, because that's what happens when you read fiction, and that's what she loves to read, and that's what I love to read best. And, you know, is that you become part of this other world. You imagine the world different, differently. You know, it's it's absolutely revolution, revolutionary potentially, right? To see it to imagine and see the world differently and imagine your place in it differently. And so um, they, some of the ways that um, the practice of imagination happens in the book is, for example, when uh, at Christmas, you know, they can see these, the, the woods way in the distance, which is how a lot of the, the Massachusetts, main Massachusetts prison that I went and volunteered at 
for many years is like that, and many of them are like that. You know, so you can't, there it is, the green you can't touch, and in a way that's painful, but then what she and, um, at Christmas time, she and Maxine imagine decorating those trees out there, and then they, you know, they talk up what they're gonna, what the ornaments will look like, and they, each day of Advent, Advent, they sort of do, do that together. Um, but, and then there's Maxine has that ability to conjure things, you know, moments in the past and aspects of nature and beautiful things. So that, so that's another practice. And um, the kites that they leave each, that, you know, and those are the little notes people. Um, somebody told me recently at a reading and talk I did that they thought they were literally kites, but it's just a, a term for the little notes people leave in, uh, in prison or in jail for so um, and those those little notes ask they ask each other to imagine things or, or so that's an, another aspect of the practice and um, and I guess ultimately it's about being able to imagine herself free and whole you know and and sing and raising her voice again and so I guess all those things are in service to that imagining herself beyond beyond the Razor wire and um, reunited, re, you know, reunified with her kids and see, having a, you know, owning, not erasing what has happened to her, the trauma or anything else, but owning the whole of it is sort of what she, what she works to come to and, um, and you know, ultimately imagining the, that a pomegranate is that her, that her heart is like a pomegranate that. It, 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 the seeds in it are all the things that she's been and done and that have been done, done to and for her, you know, all, all, and you can't um, excise any of that, you know, it's all, it all makes up the sto story of who you are. So I guess there's, that's the, it, it's one of the things that holds the book together, I think. Um, my dad was a criminal defense lawyer, and um, yeah, and uh, and the people you know, growing up, the people he represented were not like other and visible, you know, to me. They were part of like, my understanding, you know, that I was given was that they were part of my people and my community, and that I also um, had a responsibility to you know use the access and and um, privilege that I'd had, you know, to to speak out about things. So. He also, I think, it really imparted in me some basic things I've always carried with me, and I wanted to write something about incarceration. And you know, to, it, it, I didn't even know when I started volunteering like what shape that would take. But, but he taught me, I think, that you know, everybody has a story that's complex and deserves to be seen and heard, and that you know, some of us grow up without you know, love or resources or possibility or choices, right? And that justice is a fiction for some of us. So I think all the, you know, all of that he would have put into me. And my mom was a literature professor, and so she gave me stories to see by, you know? And so I think that in this book, I'm really drawing on, like, they're both gone and gone and not gone, you know, now. But um, I'm really drawing on what both of them, the, the, the understandings, I think, they, they both gave me about how, about how to be in the world. So, so that was the sort of origin, was that those seeds that, that he planted in me. And then, you know, I had not been locked up, so I knew I had to kind of earn that story, and I didn't want to try to tell it in an appropriative way, you know? And I, I, I mean, there is, a, there is a inherently a, a challenge in writing about some people who are whose lives are vastly different than yours, you know. Well, that's the fiction writer's job, right, to imagine lives different, different than her own. But still, you know, it, I, I have struggled some with wa make, wanting to make sure it didn't feel like I was, um, you know, claiming something, a, a story that, that wasn't mine. So it mattered to me, like, the spirit in which I did that. And I volunteered for 17 years um, and started, helped to, started a um, creative writing program through Penn, New England, in um, a men's uh, prison where I went for all those years, first, in, first through a different, through the Houses of Healing program, and then 
for eight years with the um, Penn New England one, and we were also in uh, um, South Middlesex, which is a pre-release facility for women related to Framingham Prison. And I've you know I've taught, volunteered in other contexts too. Um, so all sort of you know earn, earning that story, I guess. Yeah, but I, I mean, I changed, you know, I, I was profoundly changed by it and, and um, grew from it. It was one of the most meaningful things I've done. And, and then, sadly, that prison closed and Penn New England fell apart. And I haven't been in, in, in year, years, but um, I am about to, I've been at MIT for, it'll be 29 years in June, and I'm retiring, but I'm going to be a professor post-tenure, and I'm going to work on, this prison initiative they have. We've run um, some um, book discussion groups for women. So I'll, I'll be able to do that, some of that work again. How, how has the reception been from formerly incarcerated women who have read your book? Yes, I, you know, there have been some. It's been positive. And I have some chances, like this, um, through this MIT prison initiative, one idea they had with the people who organized it was that I would have discussions of pomegranate with them, so that would be that would be cool. But um, yeah, there's a, it's been get, donated a couple places, and, and um, in uh, March I'm going to Columbus, where a friend of mine who was instrumental in me kind of um, earning the story. Uh, she runs a program for incarcerated people, and they're, I'm going to get to go in and do a reading and okay. and talk to women there. So. So, so, you know, people have said it resonates. People who have worked with incarcerated free people and also people who've been in prison have said it seems to be meaningful. Yeah, I mean, actually, Riley asked a question, but I can ask it But um, so I guess I have to wind back a little. I uh, maybe let's see how many years ago. I don't know. So, uh, I guess I started going, doing the volunteer work about twenty years ago. For a couple of years, I just listened and didn't know what you know would come, what the shape of what I would write would be. And then I did write a novel. Um, it was called Life Without. It was about ten people five, who were incarcerated, five women and five men, and prisons down the road from each other, and I couldn't get that book into the world, and, you know, now, now I understand why better, but also it was partly about the, just the moment people said things, like, you know, people don't buy, editors said, oh, this is emotionally wrenching, or whatever, or important, or whatever, or beautiful, or whatever, but people won't buy it, and they just didn't see, who was the audience for a book like this, or painful things like that, which is kind of a way of saying these lives don't matter, I think, you know, and then, um, I let that go. I pulled, there was a, a story of a DNA exoneree, one of those 10 people, and I, I pulled him out and wrote a novel. I had a different agent and couldn't sell that. And then I kind of stopped um, writing, or I never stopped writing, but I stopped trying to get things in the world. I did publish some of those stories that, that you mentioned from it. And then, um, I don't know, things came together to make me just decide to try again. And so I pulled Renita, Renita was one of those 10 characters, so I pulled her story out of there and grew, grew it into a novel. And, um, the, but the first book, Life, that was really, it was, it was very dark, which is partly why, why I now see, you know, it would, would have been pretty hard to, hard to publish. And no, you know, nobody got out except the DNA exonery. And there, there were some, like, psychological and spiritual kind of recoveries or revolutions among some of the characters, but it was really, um, really dark and painful. And, and when I was working on that, my son was really little, and I, that, that's, 
that was the hardest, like, to come, because you do have to go, you have to become the characters and live in their world, you know, that's, that's what writing fiction entails, I think, it's, it's beyond, like, radical empathy, you really, I mean, I, you know, was Renita a lot of the time in my imagination, and, um, experiencing what she'd experienced, so, so, um, when my son was really little, I, there would be times I would pause, because it felt like it was just too hard to leave it behind, and you know, be a positive, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Yeah, be, be a mother. Um, but, you know, he's all grown now, and, and, and he's an artist, too, and struggles with making, work, you know, work that's complicated and provocative and, and painful, too, sometimes. So, um, so I don't know, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's a struggle to be well, I guess, just like everybody is engaged in. Something about a uh, practice of leaving behind what you're working on and returning to regular life, I think, is what, is what makes it possible. You know, kind of, kind of like with, um, you know, warfare, people, you make yourself other, right, in order to do the, the needed thing, and then you have to have a way to return, make yourself, I don't know, that's what, that's what war paint is, for, for example, you know, so I think you, you find some way, maybe through, you know, through the way you organize your writing practice, or I, I think I was doing that a little bit, and then you, you, shut, you stop for the day, and you take a walk, and you come back, you know. It's still running through you. Yeah, it's just, I mean, maybe, you know, just like with the pomegranate seed, that's in, that's in, the book's in me, and those, all the people in it are, are part of me. But again, like, I feel her story is one of triumph, you know, and I knew she was going to make it. That's what I had in mind for her. You know, I mean, and uh, that's not totally settled at the end of the book, but that's what I imagine. You know, she, she, uh, she with the, another resource she has to draw on is this um, wonderful psychotherapist, black male psychotherapist, because she, in order to, for family reunification, you know, which is she's engaged in that process. That's man, psychotherapy is mandated. So that's another thread through the book and echoing the other, all of the other resources. And, and he's, you know, um, steady and loving and, and caring. And so, um, yeah, anyway. When I met Helen, she had as an aside, one day she just said, I have three novels in my desk drawer, and I couldn't get it out of my head. I was like, you have what? Where? <laughs> she was like, yeah, I'm just like, I'm not ready to return to them yet. I was like, them, plural, you have three novels in your desk? And yeah, yeah. that was a stepping away. And, and she away. was, so, she actually, I owe a lot to Kimberly, because she was like, never stop saying, you gotta, you gotta get back you know, you try. You gotta try. Get them out there. I am a known celebrity stalker, and I stalk writers. <laughs> this is understood. So, <laughs> yes. Do we have any other questions? Final one. Anyone? Okay. <laughs> I absolutely hate the show, Orange Is the New Black. Okay. a gaze upon black women yeah. that's already twisted and warped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I watched the whole thing just so I could argue with people about it. What do you feel about that show? I, I did not watch that show intentionally. Yeah. I did two and a half seasons and then I stopped. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't know. Yeah. It seemed, I was trying to do something, you know, so, so different, I guess, than what they were trying to do. But also, I, I, maybe I just, I just thought it would break my heart. But I did watch a lot of, you know, documentaries and read lots of stuff and all that. I mean, that was part of the earning the story, too, I guess, re that sort of research. And there's great resources like the Marshall Project, which is the, like, clearinghouse for all things um, 
criminal legal system and incarceration related. It's a pretty amazing resource, and that's just, I don't know, the last, within the last 10 years, maybe five years. And, and they have, um, I mean, an art, you know, every kind of resource and article, but also one of the beautiful things they have is a column called um, in, in, or from the inside or something. So um, incarcerated people, you know, are able to publish their, their pieces. And they're, they're about all kinds of everyday aspects of or how people get through or maintain their dignity. And I, you know, I was able to get or affirm the details that the details I had chosen were right. I guess that's the way from, from you know, reading those first person accounts. And I mean, you can find so much stuff online. With that, yes. can we thank Helen Elaine Lee once again? Thank you all.